Uh, hey, everybody. And with us is Frank Fukuyama, who's been doing a lot of fascinating work with uh, just characterizing the arc of society, like uh, just calling out his books on origins, political order and political order, political decay, kind of a you know, two volume book on just how society functions is just shockingly enlightening. And uh, today he's going to be talking about how COVID is affecting, you know, the global political order. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Frank. Okay, uh, thanks very much. So I understand I'm talking to a group of modelers. Uh, in the latter part of my talk, I'm going to say something uh, more specific about uh, how you model some of the things that I'm describing. But I'm going to start by a general overview of how to think about how the COVID epidemic is going to affect uh, global politics. And I think the first thing <laughs> uh, to note is that um, you know the long-term consequences of any major crisis like the one that we are living in uh, is really very very hard to uh, predict uh, at this early stage. If you think about the Great Depression, for example, uh, it starts in 1929, but some of the longer-term consequences are the rise of fascism, Hitler and Mussolini, the Second World War. But then also Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal, the rise of the United States, and you know the kind of post-war world that emerges after 1945. And none of that would have been uh, predictable uh, in the early 1930s. And then you know the more recent ones. I think that, for example, the financial crisis in 2008 had a lot of you know relatively predictable short-term economic effects. But one of the longer term consequences, I think, was the rise of uh, populism in the United States and ultimately the election of Donald Trump in 2016. And I think back in 2008, nobody would have seen that uh, coming as a consequence. You know, so there's lots of things. I mean, September 11th, there are uh, <clears throat> a lot of events that we've lived through, or at least some of us have lived through that, um, you know, should give us a little bit of humility in, in talking about uh, uh, predictive outcomes. Uh, you know, I used to belong to an organization called the Global Business Network that was started by Stuart Brand and, and Peter Schwartz uh, that did scenario uh, planning in which they deliberately stayed away from giving probabilistic weights to future scenarios. And they forced people to actually think about plausible ones and to pay attention to the low, what they would otherwise assign a low probability to, uh, because those were you know, in, those were exactly the ones that came and, and you know, bit you in the ass uh, later on. And I think that's something healthy. And so rather than, you know, trying to make any predictions and extrapolating from current events, I think it's probably better to think in terms of alternative scenarios. Now, when I think about the impact on global politics, uh, I think in the first instance about how the performance in dealing with the epidemic uh, affects the political fortunes of uh, individual countries. Uh, and the, the, so, and, and there's a, been a big debate ever since the epidemic started as to what, the, what success uh, correlates with. Uh, we can talk about good measures of success. I mean, I think there are probably something like per capita infection rates uh, or per capita death rates. Uh, I'll get into this later. I mean, even those are kind of, it's hard to get good comparable cross-country data because countries measure these things differently. Uh, but if we say we're interested in outcomes, then the question is what kinds of um, characteristics of countries uh, correlate uh, there's been a lot of talk that authoritarian countries uh, do better, for example, than democratic ones. Uh, I think that even observing, you know, a pretty small uh, statistical sample would indicate that that's really not true because you actually get a tremendous amount of variance across both of those categories. And so among democracies, you have some very poorly performing ones like Brazil and the United States, and then you have others like South Korea, Taiwan, Germany that have done actually uh, extremely well. And I think you get a similar kind of variance across um, authoritarian countries. So China actually didn't do well at first. Uh, they got it under control, and now you know they're uh, 
uh, uh, they're doing well. But Belarus, I think, if you've been following events there, uh, you know, it's the last Soviet-style dictatorship uh, in the former Soviet space. Um, and I think that some of the current unrest that's trying to unseat their dictator, Lukashenko, is actually due to his poor performance in uh, dealing with a COVID epidemic. And so I think that's probably not uh, an explanatory variable. I would think that there are other issues that are more uh, important. Uh, obviously, state capacity uh, matters. And state capacity simply means, you know, do you have a public health infrastructure that's adequately resourced, that has access to sufficient personnel, uh, doctors, you know, nurses, public health uh, professionals, um, uh, hospitals, uh, and the like. Uh, I think that there's a basket of social um, factors that are extremely important. For example, the degree of uh, polarization uh, in the country, because that's obviously something that has tremendously weakened uh, the American response uh, to the disease. Um, different countries, you know, behave differently with regard to individual liberties. Some countries tend to be have societies that are much more compliant with orders that come from above, and others, you know, tend to resist them. And so, uh, there are social factors of of that sort. Uh, and then finally, I think there's a bunch of political uh, uh, factors that have been really pretty uh, pretty decisive. Uh, in fact, um, we had a little group at Stanford. We I'm I'm part of an interdisciplinary institute called the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies, and we have political scientists, economists, you know, public health uh, professionals, doctors, engineers, so forth. Uh, and actually, it was one of the public health people uh, when we were discussing, you know, how you would model the likely uh, performance of, of different countries cross-nationally, basically said, it's the politics, stupid, because uh, the kinds of issues that his fellow health professionals tended to follow, in his view, were really not the most important ones. It, it really did have to do with uh, political responses. And there's a lot of things that are wrapped up in that basket, not just whether you're democratic or authoritarian, but whether you're a federal system or a unitary uh, uh, government, uh, the degree of political interference that's possible in, uh, in your, um, you know, your bureaucracy and uh, things of that sort. Uh, so I think, you know, there's some combination of those three baskets that probably explain why on the one hand, Taiwan and South Korea had such, you know, tremendous performance. They had a good public health infrastructure. They had a lot of trust in the political uh, leadership and they had a population that was quite compliant with mask orders and, you know, plus which they actually had experience with SARS, with a, you know, earlier uh, pandemic that allowed them to uh, get prepared. Um, and then other countries like the United States, well, we'll get into <laughs> longer discussion of that uh, shortly. Um, now, if you think about broadly how the pandemic is likely to uh, affect global politics, I think the consensus view is it's going to be bad from the standpoint of democracy, human rights, rule of law, and those normative political institutions that we tend to favor in, uh, in the United States. And you can already see a lot of examples of uh, what the problem is, because quite a number of countries have used the pandemic as an excuse to expand executive power. So this happened early on, for example, in Hungary. Hungary has been in the grip of a populist uh, prime minister, Viktor Orban, for you know, the past decade, um, uh, he's used that to undermine the courts, the media, you know, opposition uh, groups. And one of the first things he did after the pandemic started was to get parliament, which was controlled by his party, Fidesz, uh, to vote him uh, emergency powers, which he has not relinquished. And this has been going on in a lot of places in, you know, in Uganda, in El Salvador, uh, in Tanzania. Uh, you know, it happened in China as well, because I think 
the Chinese used the pandemic as an excuse to extend their national security law uh, to cover Hong Kong. You know, they had withheld uh, a crack, they, they'd not cracked down on, on the pro-democracy protest in Hong Kong for all of last year while they were going. Uh, but then all of a sudden they do it uh, this winter because of the uh, pandemic. Uh, I think that you've had a period now that's lasted, you know, it really got kicked off in 2016 with the election of Trump and the Brexit vote in Britain, where you've had a rise of global populism. That's a whole separate lecture I could give, but, you know, this is, I think, essentially an economic and a cultural revolt uh, against elites that have been running the global economy for the last 50 years. Uh, and it's based on a lot of resentment that those elites have structured a liberal world order that's good for themselves. And so they've gotten uh, a lot richer, uh, but it has not been good for ordinary uh, working people. Uh, and in particular, the right rather than the left has profited from this because they're able to interpret this culturally as, you know, a loss of national identity to globalists and so forth. And the remedies uh, are basically a return to a certain kind of nationalism and isolationism. And so you see this, you know, in uh, Trump's trade policies, uh, essentially launching trade wars, not just against uh, China, but against, you know, Canada and the European Union and, you know, a lot of close uh, American allies. You see this in um, immigration restrictions that um, are probably the single thing that unite right-wing populists across uh, the world is hostility to foreigners. And obviously COVID is a perfect opportunity to um, do more of that. Uh, and we've had, you know, a lot of border closures, which were perfectly justified in public health terms, but this is something that was eagerly uh, seized upon by uh, a lot of nationalists. And I think that, um, you know, we're actually trying to do a much more systematic study of how this has happened, uh, uh, played itself out in uh, a lot of developing world countries. I mean, that's one of the things my center at Stanford uh, studies. And, and so collecting data on this systematically, you know, we're so preoccupied right now with the United States and we've not been paying a lot of attention to what's been going on in a lot of smaller countries. But uh, unfortunately, I think the impact on global democracy has really been uh, quite, uh, <clears throat> uh, quite severe. I think in terms of the realm of ideas, uh, it's also not been good. Um, you know, I think if you look statistically, as I said, across authoritarian versus democratic states, I don't think you'll find a strong correlation between uh, pandemic performance and regime type, um, because plenty of democracies have actually done well. But I think that the popular perceptions around the world are not based on statistics. They're, you know, they're based uh, much more anecdotally on actually the performance of two countries, and that's China and the United States, uh, both of which end up being symbols for a certain type of government. Uh, China for a kind of uh, authoritarian quasi-market uh, 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 system, and the United States as the, you know, world's oldest democracy. And here the comparison is really bad. If you've been looking at the recent GDP statistics coming out of China, they basically recovered. Uh, and they may actually in the third quarter uh, beat the uh, growth numbers that they were aiming at uh, you know, pre-pandemic, uh, which is quite remarkable given the fact that you know, this was a pretty severe outbreak that they had to deal with back in January uh, and February. But using authoritarian methods. They've been pretty successful in uh, containing it and doing contact tracing. They had this social credit system, uh, a little bit like what you guys at Google are trying to implement uh, you know, privately. Uh, this is one that's run by the Chinese government with the you know full cooperation of these big Chinese tech companies. Uh, and they can use that to uh, intimately model uh, or and, and um, not just model, but actually control uh, individual behavior by Chinese citizens. So uh, 
if you post something on Weibo that is critical of the government, you'll find that you can't buy an airplane ticket to go visit your relatives and the, at New Year's. Uh, and this is all done, you know, through an AI system uh, that doesn't even require uh, human intervention. And so obviously they can do contact tracing much more effectively. Uh, the United States, in my view, has, you know, I wrote this, I wrote about this in my last book, um, uh, Political Order and Political Decay, which was published before Trump's election in 2014. And I argued that there was a lot of evidence that American, uh, the American sy political system was in decay, that it was not working uh, as it had through most of the 20th century. It was increasingly being captured by powerful interest groups. It was becoming progressively less representative of um, you know, ordinary uh, Americans. Uh, and it was so rigid that it was impossible to fix a lot of the problems that were pretty evident uh, in the way that we organized our uh, democracy. Uh, and this is something that's really been going on uh, for the past 20 years. I would say the single greatest weakness of the United States as a society right now is the degree of political polarization uh, between red and blue. And it's completely undermined the ability of the United States to respond to the COVID epidemic because the response itself has become uh, a political issue. So wearing masks uh, should be a public health consideration that's done rationally by people that want to protect themselves and other people. And instead, it's become a political uh, symbol. It's become a symbol of identity. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that I think that if you look at the causes of populism around the world, and especially here in the United States, you know, they have, it has economic roots in, in the kind of inequality that has appeared as a result of globalization. But it also has this incredibly strong cultural element where people will override their rational self-interest in the name of expressing solidarity essentially with their tribe. Uh, and this is really what we're seeing, you know, every day in uh, American politics that, you know, wearing a mask is a, a symbol of loyalty to President Trump, to, you know, conservatism, and wearing a mask is something of the opposite. Uh, I think that that polarization is not really quite symmetrical because I think what's happened on the right is is actually much more unique. But uh, but I think it's been an incredible source of weakness in the United States because it's something that foreign countries like Russia and China uh, have been able to exploit and they're gleefully doing it. Uh, Russia in particular has been particularly skillful at this. They recognize the power of social media very early on. Uh, what they want to do is not pr promote their system or a particular point of view. What they basically want to do is just weaken uh, all of their opponents and rivals. And they've done that by, you know, encouraging conspiracy thinking on the right, but also, you know, they'll imitate a Black Lives Matter activist and, you know, encourage violence or more radicalization of positions. Uh, uh, and they've done that quite effectively, and they've apparently got the president on their side in terms of, you know, their uh, intentions. So, um, you know, this is a problem that I think we're going to have to deal with, even if you have a democratic victory in November, the polarization is not going to go away, and you'll still have uh, at least a third of the country that has um, uh, become, you know, deeply uh, disaffected from uh, from uh, mainstream politics, uh, and that is going to, you know, weaken any attempt to uh, return to a kind of liberal order, both domestically and internationally, uh, if uh, even if uh, the election goes in favor of the Democrats. All right, so uh, I would say, uh, I just to conclude this part, there are also some good scenarios, and I think actually, um, putting some brakes on global populism may be one of them. Uh, in contrast to other calamities that can befall societies, your response to a pandemic is pretty, you know, the, the, the link between cause and effect is 
much more evident than in other areas of policy. So for example, if you screw up education policy or um, you know some other thing that acts only in, in, in a long-term way, you're not gonna know the impact uh, for 10 years. And even after 10 years, you may not be able to really detect it because of all the noise of you know, confounding, um, confounding variables. Uh, but with a pandemic, if you really screw up, you're going to see the results, you know, fairly, uh, fairly quickly. And I think that, you know, that's happened in a lot of the countries where you've had populist leaders. Uh, the, besides the United States, I'd point to Brazil and uh, Mexico, both of whom elected a populist leader. So this was Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, uh, populist of the right. Uh, and uh, Andre, uh, Manuel Andres uh, Lopez Obrador in Mexico, AMLO, uh, who's a populist of the left. And like Trump, all three of them basically denied the reality of the disease. They claimed that it wasn't, you know, it was not as bad as the flu. Uh, they did not take measures to combat it. And as a result, all three countries have uh, comparatively really bad uh, results in terms of uh, pandemic outcomes. Now, Bolsonaro, strangely enough, has protected himself because he's gotten behind a big spending program to, you know, subsidize poor Brazilians. And so uh, his popularity, which tanked at the beginning of the crisis, has begun to come up a little bit. But, um, you know, all three have suffered as a result of this, you know, pretty evident uh, connection between a kind of populist refusal to deal with bad news and uh, poor results. And the long-term result could be actually uh, a backlash against the backlash. Um, certainly if there's a democratic victory in November, uh, that will show that, you know, the checks and balances in the American system are still working in, in some fundamental sense, even if, uh, even if there's still a lot of problems with polarization after that. Uh, and in many other countries, I think the disease has revealed big inadequacies in social safety nets uh, and in the ability of countries to deal with emergencies, disasters, uh, and uh, really terrible public health. Um, oh, I'm sorry, one, one further thing just to say is about the developing world as a whole, because we tend to forget about a lot of that. Uh, it's very interesting because the disease in many poor countries did not look like it was that serious. Uh, you know, in the whole period through the summer. So in Latin America, in sub-Saharan Africa, in the subcontinent, uh, you actually did not have uh, acute uh, public health crises as you did in Italy and Belgium and uh, in Spain uh, and the United States. Uh, but that, I think, has all begun to reverse very dramatically because you know, it turned out that what a lot of poor countries were able to do was to impose lockdowns uh, in the short run, but they could not maintain them uh, and eventually had to get people back to work. Uh, they've got lots of people in the informal economy that are really not covered by any kind of social insurance, uh, and they've got very weak public health infrastructures. And so I think you're now seeing, uh, you know, a big increase in um, disease burdens uh, across many, you know, across many poor countries. But that is an issue that we've got to look at a little bit more carefully because there's also things that help, you know, for example, in Africa, the fact that their population distribution tends to be very young. A lot of the population is still rural as opposed to urban uh, and so forth, which may have accounted for a slowing of the disease. All right, so let me just, let you, yeah, uh, go ahead. Following up in your comments on populism, how does that, those dynamics norm, you know, how have they worked out in history? I mean, you have things like French Revolution, which seems like, you know, a very populist driven phenomenon. Yeah. Uh, and how do the, you know, how do you come back from that typically, hopefully without a revolution? Also, is the um, denial of fact a populist phenomenon that's common? Or, I mean, Trump could have waved a giant American flag and said, we're attacking COVID, but mm -hmm. he didn't. Is that normal for populism or is that just him personally? <laughs> Yeah, so, um, you know, populism uh, in the current sense, this kind of right-wing populism uh, 
is not a new phenomenon. Uh, I think it's just the latest manifestation of a something that's actually pretty familiar, which is you know classical European nationalism. Uh, and in a way, you know, some of the earliest populist movements came out of the French Revolution, uh, which was both liberal universalistic, but it was also nationalist. It was about the French nation and asserting the French nation. Uh, and liberal ideas battled nationalist ideas throughout the 19th century. And unfortunately, the nationalist ideas won. And, um, you know, the result was two devastating world wars, the collapse of Europe as a civilization. And I think you had a return to liberal um, ideas and institutions after 1945, because people began to realize that if every nation asserts itself selfishly, both in economics and in politics, you get aggression, you get breakdown of you know, world trade, you get um, uh, impoverishment of uh, countries as you did during the Great Depression. And so you create this liberal structure and the you know the institutional manifestation of that was the european union which was really supposed to move europe beyond uh uh the nation um and that unfortunately worked only i mean it worked you know i i, I don't think we should minimize the accomplishments of the european union but it did not abolish the nation state uh, and so national identities remain powerful there and that's what's getting reasserted in countries like Hungary and Poland and by these populist groups in Germany and in Britain and, and, um, and other places. Now, the question of whether uh, ignoring pandemics is necessary to populism, I would say probably not, although it's interesting. So in the case of uh, AMLO and Bolsonaro and Trump, I do think that there was probably something connected to their personal style. So populism usually designates a certain style of politics, which is very personalistic. You know, when he got the nomination in 2016 at the Republican uh, convention, he said, I alone understand your problems and I alone can fix them. And if you load up, you know, one person with this kind of responsibility, in a certain way, they don't like to face, you know, unpleasant news or, um, um, you know, associate themselves with, with bad situations. And so there might be something of a connection there, although there are other populists. So um, Viktor Orban in Hungary is a populist, and he actually closed down the country and he, you know, took the disease relatively seriously. Uh, and so forth. And so the, the correlation there is, is, you know, probably at best uh, a weak one. So it sounds like dynamics are where the Chinese government is authoritarian, but meritocratic and kind of designed itself. Populism is authoritarian, but just kind of random. Uh, yeah, well, actually, that's a good segue into what I wanted to talk about uh, in terms of how you would model uh, national outcomes, because I think that actually leadership is an independent variable. Uh, you know, I felt this, I mean, I've been having a perpetual argument with the economists, you know, that, that I deal with, uh, who want to look at economic uh, uh, variables, and then they confront political variables like leadership, and it's like a random number generator. Uh, that really screws up their models because it's very, very difficult to predict the decisions that individual leaders will make. Uh, so, but may maybe I can just run through this, right? So uh, this came out of this discussion I was mentioning where this um, doctor colleague of mine, you know, uh, said it's the politics stupid. <laughs> and uh, I think that you know, if you really wanted to model this question of who's going to do well politically, I, I'm sorry, who's going to do well in dealing with the epidemic, you know, first of all, you have to define the, the dependent variable. Uh, and as I said, there's a lot of problems with both per capita infection rates and per capita death rates because they're measured differently across countries. So you'd have to do a lot of, you know, data adjustment there, but that's a solvable problem. Uh, but when you get into the uh, independent variables that would explain those outcomes, uh, 
uh, I think you, there's really quite a lot of them that have been linked to specific country outcomes that I think in a general model you would have to take account of. And I put them into three categories, right? So the first category would have to do with uh, what you'd call, you know, epidemiological, geographic, or demographic factors. Like political scientists would say that these are country fixed effects. You know, if you're doing a, a, a multiple regression, cross-country regression, uh, and so those would have to do with the way that you know the particular epidemic interacts with different kinds of geographical and demographic factors. And so, for example, physical isolation. If you're a small island nation like New Zealand, it's much easier to close yourself off than if you're a country with really long land borders like you know the United States or Russia or uh, other places like that. Uh, population density is obviously quite important because it's transmitted in urban areas. That's really what happened in the United States. Uh, much more easily than in rural ones. Uh, I would say that urbanization you know, is related to population density, but the degree of urbanization uh, would be an important factor. Uh, and then the gender and age distribution of the population, because you know, we've come to understand that COVID affects men more strongly than women, and that it affects old people and people with comorbidities you know, much more effect, uh, much more seriously than uh, younger and uh, healthier people, right? So that's one set, and that's what epidemiologists really, you know, tend to focus on is that basket of uh, considerations. But beyond that, the second basket, I would say, has to do with social conditions and behaviors. Um, so one obvious one is per capita income. Uh, rich countries can, in theory, deal with the disease better than uh, poor ones, although as we've seen, the disease hit some rich countries like Italy and Spain uh, early on and quite hard. So obviously that by itself is not a sufficient condition uh, for good performance. Uh, I would say that, you know, especially when you're looking at the developing world, the proportion of the workforce that is in the uh, informal economy would be a really important measure. Uh, in Latin America, for example, almost every country in Latin America has over 50% of its labor force in the informal sector, meaning they're not registered businesses, they don't have access to, you know, I mean, most social benefits like health insurance, pensions, um, unemployment insurance are all tied to uh, work in a formal uh, registered company. And, you know, in Peru, for example, 70% of the labor force, if not more, uh, are outside of that formal uh, labor market. So that is important. Uh, you have a factor of trust. Uh, and so you have uh, two different kinds of trust, trust in the general level of trust in society, and then trust in the government and in particular institutions of the government. Now, these are actually measured like both the general social survey and the world values um, uh, survey um, have trust questions in them. So you can get cross-country comparisons, but they're done at an aggregate level uh, that makes it in a way hard to really capture what's going on. Because if you said, well, what's the level of trust in the US government? Well, that's been going down. We know that uh, pretty, pretty clearly. That th that's been in secular decline over the last 50 years. But there's a question in the general social survey, do you trust your fellow citizens? And the United States typically scored relatively high compared to other societies on that question, but we don't know how people are interpreting it. You know, does it mean, do you trust people in your neighborhood? Do you trust Americans in general? Uh, and I would say, given the degree of polarization, um, the general trust of, you know, one American for another has got to have gone down, but it's not really picked up in that kind of Data. Another way of measuring it would be a, a continuum between what I would call a high compliance society and a libertarian society. Uh, and this is a cultural characteristic. You know, in Asia, for example, it's a cultural stereotype, which I think is, like many stereotypes, is actually grounded in a certain reality, 
uh, that people tend to be pretty compliant. When the authorities tell them to do something, uh, they don't immediately say, ah, oh, you're violating my rights, I'm not going to do it. And in the United States, uh, you know, one of the deepest aspects of our political culture is to resist authority. That can be families, you know, employers, uh, and the government, especially the government. Uh, and this is one where, you know, I'm pretty sure this is an important characteristic, but I really do not know of anybody that's attempted to uh, measure anything like this. Uh, a related one would be a measure of the degree of polarization. Now, that's something that actually we do have, I mean, political scientists have, de have developed measures for this. Uh, it's a little bit complicated because some countries are not just polarized, they're actually split among four or five different camps. And so it's not red versus blue, but like in Italy, there's really a kind of four or five way split uh, in the population. And somehow you need a variable that picks uh, that sort of thing up. All right, so that's basket two. That's the, uh, the social and um, behavioral indicators. And then finally- there, you about that yeah. one, particularly in a way that's relevant for you know, this company, it's not quite obedience, but communication. So if you want to spread mm -hmm. a message, uh, the earth is round, uh, something neutral, but it's not, because there's still people denying it. Uh, what kind of populations are receptive to such communications? Which ones are not? I'm thinking maybe East Asia may be more compliant to authority, but let's say India, it's not that they resist authority, they can just don't care. Uh, what kind of stuff would have to be captured about a population to know how messages, you know, information campaigns might spread? Yeah, well, that's a really interesting question. And um, I think that that's something that really needs to be studied. So, for example, you know, it used to be among political scientists, there was a kind of recognition that uh, belief in conspiracy theories tended to be much stronger in certain regions, like they're rife all over the Middle East, right? That many people in the Middle East do not believe that if, you know, something were to happen in their society, that that's, you know, the result of some clear cause and effect of, uh, you know, what, let's say, the mainstream media is explaining, but it's actually British intelligence or the CIA or some other shadowy force that's acting in the background. And we all always used to tell ourselves that, you know, that's the result of either uh, a society where people are not empowered you know, to make their own decisions, don't have, there's no accountability in the political system and therefore they're prone to this sort of thing. But the degree of conspiracy theory uh, uh, susceptibility in the United States over the last, just over the last year has been astonishing. Uh, you know, the QAnon phenomenon is no longer a fringe movement. Uh, there's some really scary data coming uh, out uh, about the number of Republicans who actually believe that the Democrats are running tunnels under Washington, D.C. so that they can uh, kill children and harvest their blood for a potion that they, they want to take, right? So completely nutty theory. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's spread, uh, you know, enormously. And I, I don't even have a beginning of a theory about why well, actually, there's a very nice podcast that was just done uh, by the Bulwark, uh, by a journalist that had spent time in Kenosha in the last month, just talking to ordinary people in Walmart parking lots. This is where she came away very scared because like 30% of her, um, you know, her interviewees actually believe some version of that, you know, that conspiracy theory that I just um, mentioned. And you know, there is a kind of history to this in terms of the gradual erosion as a result of the internet and then social media of the authority of established uh, institutions. So that's something that's been going on. But then there's something else happening in the society that makes people go to this next state. You know, so it's one thing to say, well, I don't believe the New York Times because they're biased. I mean, I... <laughs> I personally think the New York Times is biased, right? I mean, that's not a that's not an insane position to take. It's another one. Uh, you know, you're taking an, another step to say uh, the mainstream media is deliberately lying to us 
uh, and they're simply making up facts uh, and, and, and stories. Uh, and that kind of thinking has really taken off. And so I think that your measure of this propensity, uh, first of all, there is no measure of it, uh, but I think we're not, we're not remotely close to understanding what the sources of this thing are, uh, and certainly not close to even, you know, measuring the recent changes in it. So that's, <laughs> that's kind of disheartening. Okay, look, if I can just continue to, to my last basket, which is the politics and the institutions, right? So that is uh, another clear set of independent variables that would determine how effectively a country can respond. Uh, by institutional factors, I mean things like state capacity. You know, what does your public health system look like? How well resourced is it? How many doctors and, uh, and nurses and clinicians do you have available to your population? Uh, a second one has to do with government structure, right? So are you a federal system or a unitary government? Federal systems uh, introduce an extra layer of complexity because obviously in this country, red states and blue states have responded to the epidemic very, very differently. And they're allowed to because of our, uh, because of our federal uh, system. Uh, I think that another important political factor is the degree to which there's political control over the bureaucracy. Uh, there's this really interesting story developing out of Sweden. Uh, there's the, you know, the public health official Anders Tegnell is the one that devised this really different Swedish policy of not ordering a general lockdown uh, and allowing people to continue their lives in contrast to everybody else in Scandinavia. Uh, and you know, he could do this. It wasn't a politician that made that decision. In the Swedish constitution, bureaucrats are given authority over major health policy decisions. And so the prime minister and the cabinet in Sweden did not weigh in on this decision not to lock the country down, which is really quite remarkable. But that obviously, you know, made Swedish policy very different from uh, policy of other European countries, right? So that's an issue. In our country, we have a very politicized bureaucracy to begin with, you know, 4,000 political appointees across the federal government. Uh, and that's obviously been a sore point in terms of this fight between, you know, the political leadership and, and, and health professionals. And then finally, so we get back to the question that, um, uh, that Greg uh, raised, which is the na nature of leadership. Uh, and as I said, uh, this is, you know, I, I just think this is a random number generator because, um, you know, I've seen political scientists try to do things like model, you know, the likelihood of particular kinds of leaders emerging. Uh, but in the end, uh, I, I think that's kind of a hopeless task because it's some, you know, combination of individual characteristics and then social structural factors that make certain leaders appear, you know, obviously you have to have a society that is open to a certain kind of message, but then you actually have to have somebody that, that, you know, that creates the message. And I think Trump is kind of a genius, you know, he saw that there was an opening for a certain kind of populist message and he walked right into it. And if he had not been around, it's, you know, there's no particular reason to think that there would have been another Trump that would have done exactly the same thing that, that he did. Uh, so this is why I think overall within these three baskets, some of these variables have existing measures. Um, uh, a lot of them are not, you know, terribly good. Uh, some of them have no measures that I can see at all. And I think would really have to be uh, measured. If you guys can come up with, um, you know, metrics for uh, some of those variables that I think are really not covered by existing data sets, I'd really be interested in, in, uh, in hearing that. Uh, so maybe I should just stop there and, uh, you know, we can open it up more generally. So before I ask anything, uh, what does everybody else have to, you know, thoughts, comments? I have one question, actually. So this is Osgun. Um, thank you so much for talking. It was uh, amazing. Um, so I'm from Turkey. Uh, we have Erdogan, which kind of reminds me of uh, you know, Trump and all. So the interesting thing is um, in Turkey, we don't have electoral vote like here. 
but we do have somehow a represent a suppression of representation like the east part kurdish parts can vote but they don't get to the um unfortunately they don't get to the how to say the congress let's say um because they have to mm -hmm. the, the one party has to like 10 percent of the overall population to get to the Congress. so there's always suppression for one region in a way i feel here because of the electoral vote some parts of this country are suppressed in terms of how they are getting represented in terms of the final result in the whom we select. So I wonder if you observe such a correlation between in so-called democracies when there is like regional suppression, we get to have these populist leaders and they tend to stay a long time. Thank you. Um, well, okay, uh, there is a broad generalization that you can make about populist leaders that is actually pretty strong. Um, I have a colleague in the political science department, Jonathan Rodden at Stanford, who's written a very nice book uh, called Why Cities Lose. And the single variable uh, that he demonstrates that correlates the most strongly with populist voting across many countries, including Turkey, is population density. Uh, so people that live in big urban agglomerations tend to vote for liberal, liberal meaning not in the American sense, but, you know, people that want a more open, uh, uh, you know, political order uh, tend to live in big cities. Uh, and the people that vote for populist politicians uh, tend to vote, in, uh, live in second and third tier cities or in the countryside. And that's absolutely true in Turkey, right? So in Istanbul and Ankara, Erdogan is not that popular. And in fact, Istanbul managed to elect, you know, an opposition politician uh, this past year, which is quite remarkable that uh, that happened. Uh, but the base of support for Erdogan is, uh, you know, in the countryside uh, and, and among kind of lower middle class Turks that, that don't live in those big population centers. And that's true everywhere. That's true in Hungary. You know, people in Budapest don't like uh, don't like Orban. And it's absolutely true in the United States. Uh, in fact, um, Trump yesterday said that uh, our performance in COVID wouldn't be that bad if you took the blue states out. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, that's true because the epidemic hit these densely populated areas, and that's where people vote for, uh, vote for Democrats. Uh, and his uh, voting base is really anywhere but these large population centers, even in red states, you know, the state capital and the place where the state university is usually votes Democratic and the rest of the state, uh, you know, votes uh, Republican. And so that's a really strong correlation that I think uh, explains, you know, it's related to the cultural division. It, it, it reflects, you know, the economy, right? So people that can benefit from the liberal open economic order tend to live in big cities with access to the global economy. Uh, and, you know, people that live in the countryside have less mobility, less opportunity, and so forth. But culturally, it's also very different because big urban agglomerations are pluralistic. Uh, you see lots of different kinds of people. You get used to having foreigners living near you, and that doesn't happen in uh, more rural areas that tend to be ethnically or racially, religiously much more uh, homogeneous. And I think that that uh, solidifies the, you know, kind of cultural solidarity that has been driving a lot of people to vote for, uh, for populists. So that, I think, is what connects Turkish populism with American populism. Other questions? Okay. Um, I've been reading this guy, Peter Turchin, who has a very the other way around view that like competition among elites makes them put out these messages against the state and then the sort of population mostly follows that. But he seems to, you know, be very good at measuring the number of nobility that there are in a medieval state and pretty bad at kind of quantifying this in a modern industrialized state. I'm just curious how you think about that. Yeah, Peter Turchin's an old friend of mine. I mean, some of the stuff that he's done is pretty interesting. Um, 
so I think you know a lot of the issue really has to do with um, how you define an elite and uh, and how you define the kind of power that they hold. Uh, one of the interesting things that's feeding this red blue polarization is the fact that the elites exercise power in very different realms. So the Republicans actually exercise actual political power and they exercise a lot of corporate power, right? The traditional political base of the Republican party was corporate America. So they represent capital and management uh, and you know, they, they've got big donors and, and, uh, and so forth. And that's why they've been able to win uh, a lot of elections, even though they've tended to lose a lot of the popular vote. Uh, but, you know, liberals uh, are heavily represented in the elites as well. Uh, it's not so much the business and political, well, it, you know, they control a lot of, uh, a lot of cities and states, but it's actually more in the cultural arena so if you look at Hollywood, you look at the mainstream media, you look at academia, you know, where I live, uh, it's pretty uniformly, uh, it's pretty uniformly liberal. And those are two very different forms of power. And I think a lot of the, um, you know, what makes this present moment in the United States particularly uh, fraught uh, I would say, is the fact that many people on both sides of that divide think that they're facing an existential choice in November and an existential fight that, you know, on the right, you hear a lot of people saying, well, the America we knew and loved is is simply going to disappear if the Democrats win. Uh, because, you know, religion, family, you know, all of our value and I hate to say, but for many people, it's basically a certain vision of white America is simply going to end if, if the Democrats win. And I think the Democrats feel, you know, democracy, the rule of law, a lot of basic institutions are at stake in this election. And if they, uh, uh, and if Trump wins, you know, that vision of America also uh, disappears. And so they they wield very different forms of power. They have very different kinds of concerns um, and, you know, I think those two narratives are really uh, competing. Now, whether that fits into Peter's, you know, framework or not, I'm, I'm not quite sure because I haven't really thought about that. Uh, but I would say in general that, you know, again, in political science, uh, elite-based theories have been around for, you know, decades. And I would say that in general, they, they hold up only to a certain extent uh, because a lot of times you get, you know, grassroots social movements that seem to come out of nowhere and uh, really upend those elites. And then, you know, eventually they force a different kind of elites or they, they really affect elite behavior. But I've, I think we've seen a, a, you know, a version of this because, you know, 10 years ago, uh, you had center left and center right elites running both the Democratic and Republican parties that were actually agreed on a lot of basic issues, like how to manage the global economy or whether the global economy was a good thing. And it didn't actually correspond to the interests of a lot of people at the grassroots. And I do think that a lot of the pressure was not it, it wasn't, you know, the situation, we got to the present not by the elites competing and manipulating things. We also got to the present by, um, you know, this grassroots pressure that then they took advantage of. But if that pressure didn't exist, they, they wouldn't have been successful. So Peter Church's theory is more on extra elites. The, what, like, medieval uh, third and fourth sons or, you know, extra lawyers that cannot find a job. These are the good organizers who, like, Lenin just, take up on popular misery, which is the other part of the index, and organize those people. So the way they can succeed, obviously, it's Peter tracks uh, how many of them there are and how miserable the people are. But the one thing he misses completely is what are the influence networks that are ex to be there to be exploited, either formal or informal. So you write about those, but, the, but are there ways of mapping those things? Like, you know, quantitatively? Uh, <laughs> You know, once they emerge, you can map them. 
Um, the problem is that uh, their emergence is something that's pretty mysterious and why certain issues coalesce at certain points in history and don't coalesce you know, previously. Uh, those could be related to structural factors, uh, but you know, it's, it's really hard to tell. Like, um, you know, you think about the, something like the Protestant Reformation. So I would say that, you know, Martin Luther was probably like one of these third sons, right? He was, uh, he was a, a priest uh, in a pretty minor uh, order, uh, not part of the, the real hierarchy. Uh, and he started complaining about the church and he tapped into uh, obviously a wave of discontent that existed throughout Germany and through other parts of Europe uh, at the existing order. Uh, and that's, it was that combination of his leadership and the intellectual leadership. I mean, it's not just him as a, as a political figure, but, but also his ideas that managed to coalesce the opposition to the emperor and to the church and, you know, led to, uh, led to the Reformation. Uh, but why that didn't happen the century before, or two centuries before, uh, I think is something that, you know, historically we have really very sketchy understanding about. And, you know, why all of a sudden populism coalesces in the way that it does, you know, in the middle of the second decade of the 21st century is also something we um, you know, maybe we can look back historically and try to figure this out, but I'm not sure that predictively you, you can get much of a forward-looking handle on this. So, yeah, I'd like to thank you, Frank. It was fantastic. Very enlightening. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.